So welcome to Hackware for September 2022, the first in-person Hackware after God knows how long. Uh, thanks everybody for coming down uh, and welcome to a new Hacker Space. It's my first time here as well, so if you want to know where the toilet is, I don't know. Ask someone else. <laughs> uh, so in case anybody doesn't know what Hackware is, it, uh, it was originally formed on Facebook. It's just a group of people who are interested in electronics, hardware, IoT, and general kind of hardware -y things uh, fell out of a bunch of interest groups uh, back in the day with uh, around Arduino and Raspberry Pi. Uh, so we are mostly chatting on Facebook, uh, although that's kind of gotten down a little bit. Uh, there's a meetup.com, official meetup.com thing there where we actually uh, organize the physical meetup. Uh, this is the team who is organizing it. It's kind of a very uh, loosely organized team. So you will see different faces every time, potentially. Uh, and if you're interested in helping out to organize this, uh, talk to us. Uh, we'll be more than happy to have more help. Uh, so now we'll quickly talk about a few upcoming things that are happening in the community. Uh, the first thing um, I'm helping out is a Singapore AUB challenge, which is a student competition uh, for underwater robots. I can quickly uh, show you. The, it's, a, it's a competition for students who, who build like these kind of underwater robots. Uh, the actual competition is open to public, which means you can watch. Uh, the competition is only open for students and the, all the registration is done. But if you want to watch, uh, you can have fun. Uh, it's over three days, so it's quite long. Uh, usually the Sunday of the competition is where most of the action is. Uh, but it's generally fun to come and geek out about robots and, and fun, nerdy, Hackery things. Uh, the other thing uh, we've already talked about, there's Geek Camp Singapore that's happening. Uh, and if you're interested in giving a talk, uh, you can go to Geek Camp. There's the call for papers is open. Uh, if there are any other related user groups that are in the meetups and want to talk, want to talk, want to talk about it right now, uh, just raise a hand. I'll, we can mention it. And then hopefully, we can have a bigger community of hardware communities in Singapore. Anyway, want to start a new hardware IoT electronics group or something like that on, on those lines. We used to have like lots. We used to have like a, a, a robot operating system specific group. Uh, I think there's still some people doing, doing that. There's, there was an FPGA group, but the pandemic things just disappeared. Um, Hackware has a telegram. Uh, if you're interested in talking, uh, like the Facebook, there's a Telegram chat, which is a little bit more active, I think, than the Facebook. A different, different group of people on Facebook and Telegram. But if you're interested in talking more about hardware -y things, uh, you can join the, ha the, the Hackware Telegram chat. Um, thanks to Hackerspace for the venue. Uh, in for quick show of hands, who is for the first time at Hackerspace, or any Hackerspace in Singapore? First time? All right. I'm 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 here at this iteration of Hackerspace. I was there the previous one. This is my first time. So in case you don't know what Hackerspace is, it's a community space. Um, the idea is to come in and, and go out and, and you know sort of use it for doing a community events, for doing your own projects. Uh, you can rent this back uh, in, in the sort of the office area. There's a hardware room over here. Unfortunately, I have no idea what's inside. Uh, it might kill us. Uh, oh, okay. Valentine will give us a, a tour of the hackerspace later. It might be booby trap for you. Uh, thanks to engineers at SG for live streaming the whole event. So the event is also live streamed and captured. Uh, if you guys don't know engineers at SG, you have to go to the website. It is amazing. Uh, Michael and his crew have been capturing the uh, videos of like live events when it used to happen back in the day before pandemic uh, for, I don't know. 10 years, and it's an amazing archive of all awesome talks that have ever happened, at and many, many other meetups in Singapore. And their YouTube channel is awesome. So I'm going to check it out. And a big thanks to them for uh, covering this and this amazingly hard work for so many years. So thanks, Michael. Uh, next up, uh, we have three talks. The first one is a joke talk uh, by me. Uh, I put it in because nobody wanted to sign up, and I decided I will just talk about something random. So uh, don't expect much on that one. Talk is by Michael, not that Michael, this Michael, uh, about a robot. Oh, hello. Uh, that's over here, I think. Uh, and then the third talk's by Claudio. 
Uh, that's uh, about an external projector. So uh, I will switch over to my presentation and I'll start the talk. All right, no worries. All good? Cool. Uh, five PCB tricks I learned from staring at people's design. Uh, the pandemic was long and I was bored uh, sometimes. So I was staring at people's PCBs. So I learned a few interesting things and I thought it would be fun to share these. Um, before we start, uh, who am I? I am not a hardware designer. I am a software guy. Uh, I have al almost no PCB design experience. I have built two PCBs in my life. Uh, and they were both tutorials, so I have re really no experience. I love to let out magic smoke from PCBs and electronics. Usually, uh, that's something that happens very commonly. Uh, do you know what is Bodge Life? Bodge Life is, a, is a, again, a joke, a hashtag about how all of your PCBs have bodges, uh, and every single PCB that I ever touch ends up having a bodge. Uh, so I'm really not at all a person who should be giving a talk about this. But since there was nobody talking at the meetup, I decided I'll try it out. So I'm going to talk about something fun. Uh, but it is actually really fun what you can see um, on Twitter. And it is really exciting. And I think that is what really got me really into electronics. Um, recently, it has been some really fun things that you can see on Twitter. I mean, look at this PCB. Doesn't it look really amazing and beautiful? Uh, and I think. Um, Electronics Twitter has been amazing. Uh, for whatever reasons, there's a lot of really cool people who do electronics on Twitter. And they do really fun stuff. And they do, uh, they share their designs. And it's really good to learn. Uh, and as well as to, to just, you know, all go at really pretty PCBs like this. Uh, but if, if, you are, if you're not following, if you're not on Twitter, if you're not, or if you are on Twitter, and if you want to follow electronics folks on Twitter, there's a bunch. And they are really fun. Uh, they, they do a lot of really interesting discussions. They rant about, you know, part shortages and the usual stuff. Uh, and it's awesome. Uh, open source hardware has been a really great movement for this as well. People have been sharing designs a lot more openly. And I think that has really gotten people like me who are you know, at the fringe being able to experiment and, and, and play around with hardware and, and really understand how things work. Uh, KiCad, if you don't know, is an open source uh, EDA tool. This is for designing schematics and, and making PCBs. And it's awesome. Um, and I, yeah, I love trying to make stuff. Uh, I try to make stuff. It doesn't work. I give up half the time. But, but it's it's been fun, and I think that's where most of my lessons come from. Is is some of these things. So, um, warning: if you're a serious uh, electronics person, uh, the tips I'm going to give you are extremely basic. Uh, all of them have trade-offs, uh, as with anything with engineering. And it's all rabbit hole material. I'm sure with people who are experts, we can talk about any, any of them, one of the tips to, for like two hours, four hours, 10 hours. Uh, because there's always nuances and, and, and small little details for everything that we do. So let's go. Uh, this one was interesting. When I first heard about this, I was like, what are you doing? Uh, there's this concept of a zero ohm resistor uh, that people put on PCBs. And I'm like, why do you even want a zero ohm resistor? Isn't that just a piece of wire? Like, why, why do you need to put a resistor? Why do you need pads in this? But it's actually pretty useful. Um, so uh, standard electronic circuit uh, is a regulator that takes in some input power and generates 3.3 volts. Uh, and if you put a 0 ohm resistor here, uh, you can isolate the rest of your circuit from your, your, power, circuit, uh, your power source. Uh, so you could remove the 0 ohm resistor uh, and then sort of test your regulator in isolation. Uh, and then 
if it works, if it doesn't work, fix it. If you need bodges, I always do. Uh, bodge it and you know fix whatever you know things you have broken and then put back the the resistor so you know that the rest of your circuit isn't affecting the regulator. So it's a very good way to isolate two parts of your circuit. Uh, not only from the power side, the power is something that you do very commonly. Uh, also common to use um, this to, so if you see this uh, JP5 and JP4, so these are same things, they're actually shown as jumpers, but they're actually just zero ohm resistors. Uh, so you could isolate step section. So let's say I don't want to test the e side of things first. I don't want to test the LoRa side of things first. I want to test the rest of my circuit. I want to make sure everything else is stable before I bring these up. Maybe they're causing problems. So again, zero ohm resistors. Put them on your board, remove them, dishold them, test your circuit out, and when you're done, you can put them back in. So very cool trick technique to isolate parts of your circuit from the rest. Uh, another nice thing that I've learned, so a, a resistor footprint on a, on, a, on, a, on a layout would look like this. Um, I'm going to have to walk over for this one. Uh, you can actually take, so if you pop the resistor out, if you don't, if you don't uh, solder a resistor, you can actually solder a wire here and a wire here. Uh, and put it uh, across a ammeter or a current uh, or a multimeter in a current mode. And you can measure how much current is going through this. So especially if this is a power supply and you want to measure how much your, your board is drawing or certain part of your board is drawing, it's a very easy trick to put a multimeter or an ammeter in the middle, uh, which is something normally very hard to do. You have to cut traces and sort of solder on one side and the other side, it gets very awkward. But if you have a zero resistor there, just pop it and, uh, and then put across the pad. So, Another very nifty way to go for it. You can, you can, you can. Uh, but um, if you're assembling large boards and if you're, you have lots of parts, uh, you can actually get zero ohm resistors, uh, so you can get them pick and placed or whatever uh, thing. Uh, so it's it's you can you can put a wire. You, it is. Uh, well, you can use it for debugging. I, I find it much more useful for debugging because of all the these things. Uh, but yeah. Uh, you could you could put a, a wire. I have even seen people with very fancy um, layout pads. I, I'll show you later. Uh, where you don't even need to put a resistor. You can just put like a a blob, big blob of solder, uh, and that works too. Uh, so, the, the, but but this this super interesting thing. Uh, next one. Um, I to C address pull up and pull down. This one's something that bites me all the time. Uh, lots of times, I to C peripherals tend to have this stupid thing about being able to have different addresses. And then you have generally two pins that you have to either pull up or pull down or not or be floating. And then depending on that, they will have a different address that you use to address them. Uh, this is usually done if you want to have two of the same chips on the same I2C bus. I2C is a bus protocol. Uh, so you can address them differently so you can actually talk to both on the same bus. Uh, the trick I have uh, so that I see a lot of people using is to have footprints for both pull-ups and pull-downs. So during many PCB design time, you can have all the four resistors as, as in, in, in the, the pads. And then when you actually populate your board, you can decide which one you want to populate. Very useful because you always make mistakes. I always make mistakes with this. And I'm like, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to design for blah, blah, blah. And then when you actually start writing the software, you realize, oh, crap, I designed for the wrong one. So having the footprints there, it's great. You don't have to populate all of the four 1K resistors. Just put the ones that, are, uh, that you need. Uh, so if you just want one pull up, one pull down, just put the two and then leave the, un the rest unpopulated. So it's a very easy way to sort of have all your eggs in the basket at, manufacturing, at, at PCB manufacturing time, and then you can uh, figure out what you want to do uh, at actual building time. Um, breaking out MCU pins, this one has bitten me the most, like so many times. Uh, microcontrollers have like a zillion pins, uh, and uh, Usually you're you're like oh I'm I'm only gonna need like this two I two C buses and then I'm gonna need this and that and then that's all and then the rest of the pins I'm just gonna not do anything with them because I, I'm too lazy to lay out things and then you realize that uh, two days later that oh crap um, uh, if you look at the pin muxing diagram or the table which is extremely confusing and I the first time I read it I always get it wrong that the exact pin I need the exact peripheral I need like I need an S I two C it can't be routed on the pins that I actually have out. Some of the modern microcontrollers, thankfully, allow a lot better routing, but older ones are crap at this. So um, I like what the folks at TNC did. Uh, look at the back of the thing. They have like all this tiny, tiny little uh, pl uh, pull out. So they pull out li almost literally like every single pin there is on the microcontroller. So in case you mess up, which I do all the time, uh, you all at least have the pin pulled out so you can solder a wire to it and then 
sort of you know, do something about it. Uh, maybe buy something else. Uh, but otherwise, if, especially if you're a BG or one of these really tight uh, ICs, it's. it's I mean, even if it's not a BGA, it's a very tiny thing. Soldering to those pins is impossible. Uh, I mean, you potentially could someone like you know someone with much, much experience could. I can't. Uh, I, I this just beyond me. So I think it's just easier to pull them out, especially if you're doing a dev board. Uh, if and if you're not really restricted in space, uh, put something really really tiny. Even if it's a small little test point, uh, you can potentially solder to that as compared to soldering to this tiny tiny pins on the on the on the board that you forgot to pull out. So just break out every single MCU pin, especially if you're building a first board, just break out everything. Um, right. Number four, uh, reverse polarity protection. This one's something that I heard from uh, experts and they were like, oh, you should always have reverse polarity protection for your, for your circuit. And I was like, yeah, sure, whatever, right? Uh, and then of course I do this, uh, you connect the red and the black invertly and then puff goes your circuit, it's like, oh crap. In fact, happened um, last week um, at, at, uh, at work. Uh, my colleague was uh, installing something and then it didn't work. And we we're like, why, why is it working? And we look open up, oh crap, we inverted it. Thankfully, we had reverse polarity protection, which means uh, doing this doesn't blow up a circuit. It just doesn't make the circuit work. Fine, you know, that's at least a safe default. Uh, there's many easy ways to do it. Um, they usually require a couple of chips and resistors. Uh, look up, I think, um, What's his name? Uh, Great Scott did like an entire video of like going through all the different ways of doing this. There are some benefits, pros and cons. Uh, look, look this up um, and there's always something interesting. There's always, otherwise there's always a YOLO way of doing it, uh, which is just put a reverse <laughs> diode uh, across it. And then, you know, your power supply can go <laughs> burn if it needs to. Uh, kidding, don't, don't do this. Just, just don't do this. I'm kidding. Uh, watch the video. Uh, and and try to figure out and try to figure out which is a, a, a way that works for your circuit. But I think this is a very important thing to add to anything you design. Uh, no, 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 no. So this one, uh, if if you need you need some kind of a circuit like this on on your board to do it. This this is just me doing stupid things. Uh, which I tend to do a lot. Uh, just yeah. So you need a circuit like this on your on your board, uh, but they're quite easy to do. Uh, quite quite. Uh, in fact, you can even get modules that do this for you. Uh, and and this video tells you about the the different ways you can do them, or you can do them this way, but not recommended. It will blow up your power supply. Last one. Uh, LEDs everywhere. This one's straightforward. Um, just put as many LEDs as you can. Uh, but I can. I think um, I I think what I've shown here is. Um, a couple of places where I think LEDs are good. Uh, if you have an input power, I think an LED on the input power is very useful because you want to know whether whatever is inputting actually giving you power. Very useful to have this for quick debugging. If you have a power regulator, then on the output of the power regulator, having an LED that actually uh, uh, shows you whether your power regulator is working and whether your 3.3 volt or whatever rail is up and happy, uh, also good to have. If something else shots this rail, this LED will go away, so it's very easy to know what happened, what went wrong. Or at least you know that, oh, my, my 3.3 volt rate is dead. Uh, and I always recommend at least one user controllable uh, LED on the microcontroller, because when nothing works in a microcontroller, the least you want to do is say, okay, sanity check. Can I toggle the LED on my, from my software? Is it working? If it's working, then at least you know, you're able to flash the software or whatever. So I think having at least one user controllable LED on the, on the microcontroller is, is, is recommended. Uh, the other thing I learned, another quick trick is, um, if you if you are so one of the things people always say having too many LEDs is oh it's uh, um, it's drawing too much power uh, it makes the circuit draw and if it's a battery operator especially it makes it draw too much power um, one thing you can do is play with the resistor values so maybe initially you have them low resistances so the LEDs are nice and bright and then if you if you want to like you know deploy it at some point you can just increase the resistances and make them very thin or even better just not populate these two and the LEDs won't work yeah. Uh, yeah. Once you put that exactly. Or pull the LEDs or pull the resistors or whatever. Right? So easy things to do. Uh, so that's 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 five little tricks tricks that I learned uh, just looking at people's designs. Uh, thank you for listening to my talk. I have a quick announcement. Uh, Subnero, that's where I work, is hiring an embedded software engineer. So if you'd like to do. Uh, 
embedded stuff, Linux, ARM, microcontroller stuff. Uh, and if you're in Singapore, uh, let me know. Uh, we can talk after the, the meetup as well. Uh, we do underwater comms, so we do underwater communications. Uh, so we work, we make well, the underwater Wi-Fi. Uh, but happy to talk about it later as well. Uh, that's all for now for me. So thanks. Questions? Yeah, sure. What? I yes, I am into audio stuff, but I I kind of do. Yeah. Nah, uh, not not very high. <laughs> nah, not 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 high five kind of audio, but just random audio stuff. Yes. I, I'm making the assumption that you're not from the UK yourself. No. Uh, well, uh, yeah, I'm not, but yes, we, we have people in the community. I don't think Leon's here today. We have a friend who does it. I think if you go to a lot of manufacturers online and you will specify for the MCU thing, pull out, right? Uh, they, I, I'm assuming that you, you want to pull out because you don't want it to have any, and then you can create unwanted or, or, or you, you might want to use it tomorrow. Right. You might you want to use it yeah. more. Uh, if you ask the larger manufacturers, they can actually. So, what happens is that they, they, they allow you to specify multiple uh, soldering points. So, one of them could be a uh, link to a common ground if you right. want to. So, you don't really have to damage it. Uh, it might cause a reversible damage. Uh, if you want to, you can just ask them to, to, to do that for you. And then you just, I guess, you can just solder it to a common ground or a yeah. uh, I, yep. Yeah, and then that works uh, too. Whenever you put it, you solder it, and then you put it. Yep, that could work too. Finally, I've seen boards where you've got the two uh, semi-circular patches. Yeah. Both of you have a solder, but yeah. actually, as fair, yeah. with the trace in place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And you can so cut you it. One of the boards, like a preamp, for example, yeah. radio yeah. You just cut the, the, the traces. The traces. Yeah. And I know a lot of Adafruit modules tend to have that that kind of uh, uh, design. Yeah. yeah, that's true. Yeah. These are, just thinking in general, these are all essentially sort of um, test for entries and, and, and configuration options and something. Yeah, it is, it is. Adding extra stuff to a change of runtime without it. Exactly. Whether that's a test or whether that's a test. Exactly. Yeah. So, that's, yeah. That's, cool. Cool. Yeah. Julia, is that the, uh, the software from data analytics? This one, Samira? Yeah. No, uh, we do underwater communications. Okay, no, so for the language room there. Oh, Julia. Uh, it is, yeah, it is, a, it is a computing, numerical computing language. Okay. Uh, is it used primarily for data analytics? It can be used for data analytics. It can be used for any kind of numerical computing. Okay. We can talk about Julia later. I, 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 can, I can talk to Kaos Kamam about Julia. Okay. All right. Yes. So how do you actually use it with the typing? Uh, no, uh, as in, I, there are. Uh, but most of them wouldn't bother uh, making for PCBs for you unless you are ordering in large amounts uh, yeah. locally or, or like super complex ones. Uh, so most of the time sent to China. Uh, so things like uh, PCBWay or uh, JLC PCB. Uh, so, so no one's doing PCBs at There are, there are. Actually, there are people. So Leon's not here today. So one of our friends, he actually gave a bunch of talks at Hackware before. Uh, he actually does PCBs at home. Uh, he yeah he has has tried a bunch of iterations. In fact, he gave a bunch of talks about his various iterations uh, of making PCBs at home. People have tried that and. The chemicals. Yeah. So, so I think Leon was using salt and hydro uh, uh, hydrogen peroxide. But even that, the getting access to high concentration hydrogen peroxide is annoying in Singapore. So he gets it from Malaysia. So you can, but it's just like it's industrial, so you got to go to like. <laughs> yes. And also uh, with hydrogen peroxide, it's uh, it takes time compared to fracture, so it's a bit slower. But also, you're not gonna get uh, anywhere the kind of precision that you get with factories, and it's so cheap to get them made in in uh, China these days. It's like. Ten, Twenty dollars, yeah, uh, for small ones. It's, it's more about the facturation. It is. It is. Um, I, I've seen people with um, uh, CNC-based PCB milling machines. Uh, so those I have, I, I know a few people have those. Uh, 
so that that that's there, but that only we can only do two sided. So we kind of limited on that. Of course. Thanks. All right, next speaker, Michael. Uh, let me just mirror. Oh, okay, let me mirror. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, let me just. Oh, uh, and how do I do mirror? Oh, wait, wait, not not send it. Uh, mirror filter. Okay. Okay. Cool. Okay, that that makes sense. All right. Cool. All right. Hi guys. Um, my name is Michael, and um just want to share about this project that um, uh, a bunch of us have been working for for over half a year now. Um, so uh, basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to build a, uh, a decentralized network of uh, delivery robots. So these are sidewalk robots that are not meant for to be on the road, but these are just on the sidewalk. And so maybe let me just show you some like live stream that I did. Um, let me see. Oh, wait, wait. Is it actually playing? Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah, so, <clears throat> um, so you can see my uh, controller. The, so I'm actually controlling this robot. Uh, actually, we bought the physical robot later on, I'll bring it up. But uh, essentially, this robot has a couple of things. Um, uh, it's got a front camera, rear camera. It's got GPS. Uh, it's got IMU, um, and effectively, it's, uh, uh, I think this version is not fully web RTC yet, but basically, obviously, there's a way to control the robot, and as you can see, I'm just remotely controlling it, and this is all done from my browser, so, um, yeah, and I think this trip, I happen to be going from, I think, Yishun to Woodlands or something like that, yeah. So um, let me show you another one. So this is from my perspective. Maybe I'll show you another perspective. So that's kind of from... So we, we put in a 360 camera on top of the robot. So you can kind of see... Um, we also bought the real thing here. Let me bring it up so you guys can see as well. Um, yeah. Uh, feel free to come and take a closer look after this. Oh, sorry. I got... Okay. All right. Okay. So this is not this exact robot, but this is... A, uh, we have a couple of these now. I think this is uh, still using uh, running on Jetson Nano. This this is already Raspberry Pi. Okay. Yeah. Um, so maybe I should uh, okay. Maybe I talk about this video first. So um, you know, here we're trying to cross the road. Um, I guess uh, yeah, we we have to speed up because actually right now this this current version of the robot is pretty slow. Uh, the maximum speed is something like three kilometers per hour. So it's it's almost like a slow walk. I think the goal is to get something that's around five kilometers per hour. Yeah, so it's kind of like a fast walk. Um, and this is quite interesting. So we, we actually drove the boy into, a, I think, kind of a hawker center and pick up some food. Yeah. So um, I actually wanted to let you guys try driving it now, like in real time. But actually, the other robot, like our other teammate is driving right now. As of now, at Marina Bay Sands, they're picking up some bubble tea there. So I, unfortunately, I can't let you guys try uh, but yeah, I mean, this is one where uh, we recorded this, obviously. Um, so I think in this case, what, we, what happened was we, we ordered on GrabFood uh, pickup. And, and there's, a, there's a speaker and microphone. And, you know, the guy driving just, hey, you know, this is my, my order number, one, two, three, you know, like, just, just put it in. Nice. Yeah, so, so, I mean, this is the, the basic concept, right? So maybe I, I step back a little bit and talk about, like, the genesis of this whole thing. Um, so last year... I was actually still working for another startup. Like at the time, I was doing like an edu tech startup. Um, and me and my two younger brothers. So one of them, he's been he's based in China. He's been based in China. He's basically a China man now, like, like more than ten years. Uh, he's kind of architect by training, but he does a lot of like uh, 
uh, let's say physical design, like furniture design, a little bit of product design. So he's based in China. Uh, but my youngest brother, he's actually, um, uh, right now he actually works in Tesla uh, in autopilot. So I, I, I would consider him well, a really world-class uh, self-driving guy. Yeah, so really the genius in the family. So, so I mean, I'm in Singapore, obviously. So three of us, we thought, hey, you know, three of us are all very geeky. Um, we thought, okay, let's, let's do a hobby project so that, you know, three brothers, you know, we can kind of keep, keep in touch with each other and whatnot. And so, um, uh, so it, it really just started as a weekend project. We start ha hacking something together. I think the first robot we got was, uh, uh, was, was something almost, almost like ready-made on, on Taobao. Uh, we bought it for like, I think, thousand plus US dollar. Uh, and then we put it in just a nano and then we run ROS on it. And, and I think the first time we, we tried it out was uh, the robot was in Mountain View. So my, my brother in Mountain View has a robot. So I was driving it. So that was the first time I tried out. Uh, but as you can imagine, it's just full of, um, I mean, it, we weren't doing it seriously anyway. Um, but then towards the end of last year, we started like thinking quite seriously about doing it properly as, as a, like, you know, almost like a full-time thing. Uh, and, and one of the, there, there are two, I would say, main thing that happened that, that kind of uh, was certainly made me and my second brother. So actually me and my second brother have all, both of us quit our jobs. Uh, to, to do this full-time. Uh, our youngest brother is still in Tesla, uh, good for him. Um, so, uh, so two, two development, like I said. So the first one, I, I think it was, uh, there was this other like sidewalk delivery uh, robot startup called Coco, C-O-C-O. -C -O. It's actually a kind of a spin up from, I think, UCLA. Um, they were also doing something like this. And then when I try to read up, uh, uh, what happened was they, they spin up, they raised maybe uh, a seat round, $5 million, you know, like US. Seed round is $5 million, US dollar, all right. Uh, but then quite quickly after that, I think they raised like 35 million or something like that. Yeah, and, and decent money, right, for Series A. But more importantly, it was actually backed by this guy, Sam Altman, uh, you know, who, who is the, um, uh, now he's the CEO of OpenAI, you know, used to be the president of Y Combinator. So I thought, hey, you know, that there's something brewing here. Uh, and, and obviously they are not the only sidewalk delivery robot startup uh, who has raised, uh, there are other startups who have actually raised more. Um, but that's the one that made me sit up and, and think, hey, maybe there's something here, like there's some serious backer backing this kind of idea. So, um, and, and I, I really love doing robot. La. I mean, even though, to be frank, I'm, I'm not a real engineer. Um, so I'm the guy who basically tried to put in a bunch of gigs to, to actually do it. I'm, I'm just a talker, actually. Uh, but, but, but that was the one, 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 one thing that made us think seriously about that. The other thing was... Um, uh, I started ch chatting with a friend and he was telling me about this project called Helium. Uh, anyone of you know Helium? It's a crypto project. Anyone have heard of Helium? Oh, okay. Okay, just a handful. So, um, yeah, maybe I can show you guys Helium. Helium is this, um, yeah, pretty mind. I mean, to me, I just, the first time I, I, I read about this, I was really quite mind blown, to be frank. So, uh, it's a blockchain thing. It's a crypto thing. Um, they run their own blockchain, but I think they are going to switch to Solana soon. But effectively, they are a, what they call a decentralized network of um, wireless, um, uh, wireless network. And it's at the, initially, they were on a LoRaWAN. Yeah. So, and uh, I think that they started as a startup like years ago, I think 2013. But for the first four or five years, they, they, they didn't have any much traction because they have a classic like chicken and egg issue, right? Where... For, for this network to work, they, you kind of need to form a mesh network uh, in order for you to provide like consistent network coverage. Uh, so you have a classic chicken and egg thing. Like why would someone buy the router from them if like, you know, the uh, network doesn't exist already? And then I, I think almost like a Hail Mary last move kind of thing, like in, in 2018 or 2019, they, they went and do this blockchain thing where the basic premise is you buy the router from them, you just switch it on, and they have this uh, uh, thing called proof of coverage where if there's another hotspot nearby that can see you and you also see the other guy and you kind of verify each other, right, in a kind of trustless manner, uh, then they will give you this token, right? They call it a HNT. Now, uh, we can all argue why that token has value, but somehow this token has value, okay? And but what, so they, they kind of printed, you know, a, a kind of currency in... in, in um, from thin air, but because of that, right? What what is super amazing to me is like you know, um, uh, let's see. They today they have like from almost no one buying their hotspot, 
within about three years, um, they have now close to a million hotspots around the world. And if I just, let's say, zoom into Singapore, um, I think Singapore is pretty well covered. Um, wow. Yeah, so you can see, like, let's say this, but I don't know, like where we are now, probably there's a, probably like four, four or five, like um, this hotspot is already on. Um, one thing about this LoRaWAN is that usually that the, the coverage distance is quite wide, so you probably only need like four or five. It's, it's decent coverage already. You don't really need more than four. Like four, ten is probably too much. Yeah. Um, but but again, what amazed me is that they by introducing this so-called tokenomics, they managed to incentivize almost a million people around the world. And and this this uh, hotspot sell for about say four five hundred US dollar. So effectively, they. It's almost like running a Kickstarter program where they manage to raise like two, three hundred million, right? Because you know, almost a million people pay for four, four, five hundred. Um, that's what I don't. Know. I mean, I think at least a few hundred million, right? So, uh, so they didn't have to raise that flows four, five hundred million to, uh, to build the thing themselves. But more importantly, they managed to get people really around the world, like all the key gateway cities around the world. Uh, you will find pretty good coverage, like big cities like New York, London, and whatnot. So. I just thought that it was a very interesting. Like to be frank, I'm not a crypto native at all. Like I haven't really bought Bitcoin <laughs> still to do today. Um, but uh, I I thought that this way. I mean, clearly they've shown that they have managed to create scale at a very very fast pace by throwing this crypto thing into the mix. Yeah, and it, but it's the whole thing is anchored by these IoT devices. So so I thought, hey, you know that that could be something interesting here because. Like the way we were thinking about this delivery robot, maybe I should talk about like some of the so-called, I guess, product philosophy about like what we're trying to do here. Now, <clears throat> um, there are a lot of these delivery robot startups uh, around the world. Uh, I think Singapore have a couple, and you know, all the major countries will have a ton, and some of them are very well backed. What I realized is that most of them tend to focus very much on uh, self-driving, right? Which is obviously my my youngest brother is, is to me he's a world class expert, right? So, and and. What, ha what ends up happening, though, is if you try to do the self-driving, you know, deep learning thing, you end up having a pretty expensive unit because you need to load up with LiDAR, radar, you know, a bunch of sensors, and then correspondingly, your compute is going to be very expensive, especially now, right? Uh, Justin Nano used to be, I don't know, the 100 bucks now is like, you can't even buy for 300, 400 bucks. So uh, I guess that a lot of these uh, startups, so what ends up happening is that their robot, if you look at the bomb, is at least ten thousand US dollars, if not more. Yeah. Uh, so, so um, the one that we're doing right now, I think the bomb is like less than five hundred bucks. So it, this is really like a toy. <laughs> it's literally just uh, it's, think of it like an RC car, except that you know you, you put a small computer. Right now, it's just Raspberry Pi. We started with Justin Nano, but like I said, there's no more Justin Nano, so we have to switch to switch, uh, Raspberry Pi. And 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 to be frank, initially we wanted to run some like computer vision and self driving thing. Uh, that was when we are still doing it as, as a hobby. But the more we think about it, the more we realize actually it's almost like uh, it's a little bit contrarian, like I said, because most startups in this field, they try to do the deep learning thing. We are taking almost the opposite approach. What we are thinking is it's almost there's no point doing self-driving unless you have a tremendous amount of uh, recorded data, kind of like what Tesla has done. And our view is that you probably need about 1 to 10 billion miles recorded before you should even attempt to, you know, kind of like what, what my brother does at Tesla, right? You know, like, so, so the question is how to break that G and A, right? how to get to that one to 10 billion miles uh, recorded. So we thought um, maybe the way to do it is switch the other way, just make, make this robot damn cheap, right? Almost as cheap as a vacuum cleaner uh, so that perhaps, uh, you know, small restaurant can easily afford a few or maybe the, the blue ocean idea would be maybe every household can afford one. And, and on the, but that's just a, just a device, right? Uh, but you, instead of relying so cell driving on AI, uh, which to be frank right now, like no one in the world can, can do like what they call that tier four autonomy. Um, you know, and most they can do is maybe, I mean, they claim tier four, but frankly, they still need a human to kind of jaga all the way, right? So in our mind, if you need a human there, jaga all the way, might as well just have the human literally drive the robot all the way. So instead of thinking of this whole thing as an AI problem, we are actually thinking of it as a networking problem first and foremost. So how do we solve um, uh, 4G? You know, uh, how do we solve for like uh, like WebRTC? Right. Basically, 
uh, think of like Zoom, right? You know, you know, two-way traffic, you know, video, and then you just pass another data channel. I mean, I'm making things very simplistic, but essentially it's something like that. Um, and so uh, we started doing a lot of testing. And so, uh, um, okay, maybe I'll just show you. This is, this is actually from my perspective. Uh, this is the older U UI. Um, we have a newer, like more, like almost like game like UI now, but effectively it's the same thing. So you, you can see a bunch, I mean, it's, it's very simple. Front cam, uh, back cam, some, some basic uh, stats coming from the robot, battery level, uh, the GPS data. Um, um, but the, the thing I want to point out is probably a bit hard to see. Is this is a distance log, uh, but this is so-called uh, FBT. Earn. So this is actually so-called our token. So the general idea is that, um, I mean, for, for those of you who are into crypto, right, there, there's this uh, play to earn thing. Um, and more recently, they moved to earn things. So very, very similar idea. Um, basically, we give you token based on how much you drive, something like this. Yeah, I'm simplifying a little bit, but, but effectively, that's what it is. And so we were basically trying to take the learnings from Helium and see whether we can use this so-called tokenomics to hopefully just like <coughs> how Helium got almost a million people around the world to pay for 500 bucks to get that hotspot right. Likewise, we want people to spend maybe a million people around the world to get paid, say, 500 bucks to buy one of these. Um, and then, but we, we do have another player. We need, we need to incentivize people to actually drive this thing, right? So, so that's where the so-called uh, drive to earn tokens come in. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm driving all the way, yeah. But, but the, the, actually, the end goal is the same. We want to do uh, self-driving ultimately, but we realize there's almost no point doing self-driving unless you have, in our view, like 1 billion miles, right? So to get to 1 billion miles, <clears throat> you probably need half a million to 1 billion of these robots. I mean, if you, let's say this robot, you know, usual range in a year, maybe say a thousand kilometer, then you literally need a, probably 1 million will, will get you there, right? To, to get to what, about 1 billion miles. Um, and the, the thing is, I don't know whether the self-driving on the road is, is necessary. To, it's not exactly apple to apple comparison because what my brother told me was that actually in his view, <clears throat> driving on a sidewalk is technically more challenging than driving on the road. Because driving on the road, you have traffic rules, right? So you, you can actually you know, recognize a sign, it says stop, you, know, you have the speed, you, know, you can only turn left at this junction. So it's, it's very regulated, so called traffic. Whereas in a sidewalk, even though your speed is so-called slow, but your edge cases are your norm. And basically, it's just like the, the, the long tail is just very, very long. So by, in that sense, you need possibly even more data because you just need a lot more fringe cases to, before your, your, your deep learning starts to really learn all, all, all the different scenarios. Uh, so in that sense, he, he thinks it's actually a tougher thing to do. Uh, and if you look at Tesla, they have, I don't know how many miles, of, you know, but definitely way more than 10 billion miles, right? So when I say 10 million miles, it's probably... Uh, underestimating, right? But having said that, uh, as an engineering problem, probably it's, it's, it's maybe perhaps it's easier to get to a pragmatic solution because uh, in, in the self-driving, in the road case, you know, if you fail, you, someone dies, you see. Uh, in this case, you know, this thing only costs four, 500 bucks. It's not carrying diamonds. At most, it's carrying maybe, you know, lunch or whatnot, right? So, and because this thing, move, it's, it's, it's tiny um, and it moves quite slow, so it's not going to create any damage. In fact, it's the other way. Like, you know, it's more like other people abuse it, you know, kick it around, you know. But, but well, you, 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 people don't die, you see. So in a sense, perhaps the, um, the requirement for, you don't need a Six Sigma 99.99999% like, kind of accuracy. Maybe you just need 99.9, let's say. Right? And you hopefully, you, you amortize it, especially if the cost is low. If it has enough miles uh, under it, you know, you amortize it over the, um, the life of this robot and, you know, you could, you could have actually turned over. So anyway, that, that's the rough idea. Um, uh, what else do I want to share? Uh, okay, I actually, um, camping here, I, I got actually two of my teammates here. Uh, camping here is, is one of our main uh, hardware engineers. So if you have a very technical question, you can talk to me. Uh, I'm just giving you the overall concept what we're trying to do. Uh, so, um, yeah, so basically that's uh, what we're trying to do. Um, uh, we do right now have a small team in China. Uh, so actually, to what you guys were discussing about PCB, you know, I, I, um, I, yeah, I think we're just very thankful we even have a small presence in China because it's, it's just so much easier to get things done hardware-wise. Uh, you know, the turnaround time, getting components, 
getting a PCB, you know, it's literally, they, you know, they don't even need to think about it, just send it, and, you know, even as one, two pieces, like within two, three days, they get it back, right? Um, so, um, so yeah, we, we, we do have a kind of like remote team, um, Spain, Taiwan, you know, uh, yeah, different places, but we do have a small team in China, yeah. So, um, but right now we're still very early. Uh, really, what we have now is really very, very prototype. Right? Clearly not meant for like to, to be sold to consumers. So we, we're working towards like getting into production, which is still quite a long way to go. Um, along the way, we discover a lot of things regarding the logistics and whatnot. You know, if, if you want to like, like even ship this thing to overseas, right? Like, you know, the battery consideration and all that. Um, happy to go into more details. We, we found out a lot more things recently, but um, uh, I would say like, Having done this for about half a year now, um, my personal feeling is that um, there are some cities where, let's say Singapore, where pockets in the city where you have decent 4G coverage, like as you can see, right, it, when it works, it does work. Uh, by the way, I didn't mention just now that the video you saw on, on TikTok or Instagram, right? Um, so this robot is actually driven by our, one of our teammates in the Philippines. So, so that, and, and that's one of the key things that we wanted to test, right? I, um, obviously, sometimes I drive. Um, you know, I, obviously, I'm in, I'm in Singapore. The robot is in Singapore. Um, but we actually, what we do every day, in fact, right now, like the guy is driving around Marine Bay Center, but he's actually based in Philippines. Yeah. So, so what we wanted to try is, can someone from literally really cross ocean, right? And then like maneuver this robot that's like miles away, right? And part of the consideration is also like, if we really, this were really to do delivery, like, um, like why would you, someone use this, let's say, first let's say using a human to, to deliver, right? I, I guess the, the obvious reason is you can, um, even though it's not AI, right? You're replacing one human with one human. Uh, I, I think the thought there is, uh, let's say for a place like Singapore, um, beyond certain point, right, is let's say grab food uh, or, or food panda, right, of the world, they almost have an inelastic labor uh, situation like beyond a certain point every additional delivery guy they need to make they need to pay more so they actually don't have economy of scale they will never have economy of scale especially in first tier cities so um, uh, my brother-in-law sometimes write for grab food right so he tells me you know on, uh, sometimes he get on a good hour he get maybe 15 to 20 bucks right sing dollars or if he does maybe two three delivery in an hour um, you know obviously uh, if you get someone from say Philippines Indonesia, you know, uh, um, you know, you can get way lower uh, wages, um, and and it, it's not just, I guess, the demo. Uh, it's not just, I guess, uh, geography as well. It could also be demographics. Um, so I mentioned this this guy, um, you know, team um, from Philippines. So uh, he's actually a gamer, like, You know, he actually, um, you guys know this game, play to earn, like Axie Infinity. So 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 he should play that game to earn tokens. Yeah. Uh, initially, when I first helped out, he didn't know that this is a crypto project. Um, but but you see, to him, right? He, to him is exact. He, he to him is he's just playing a video game. Yeah. So uh, I don't know whether I have the room here, but um, but actually, uh, what we want to do, right, is actually to the new UX for this is going to be a lot more like a game, lah. Yeah. So that will be like when you earn the token, you know, ding, ding, you know, like you drop coins and you know, like and then you can imagine there will be leaderboards and all that. And so we want to turn it into almost like a very fun thing to, to do and almost like you're, you're traveling the world through the eyes of a robot, right? Um, so hopefully the, on the supply on the labor, we can, we can get like tremendous amount of supply of labor. It could be, let's say, lunchtime in New York now, but it could be like midnight in like this part of the world and there are so many people available. And frankly, to do this job, all you need is a decent uh, broadband. Yeah, you don't need huge broadband. I mean, as you can see, we're running at pretty low resolution. Uh, this is running at around... 480p, right? The back camera, and then this is 7, 720p, something like that. And, and that, what we found is sufficient to drive. Um, a little bit on the latency as well. Obviously, this is not like competitive gaming. <laughs> uh, the issue right now, actually, one of the main issues we are grappling with is the, is the latency is not stable. Yeah. So it, it does fluctuate, and that makes it very hard to drive. Um, but in general, what we found is that if the latency uh, is roughly half a second or lower. That means 500 milliseconds or lower. And when I say latency, I mean a round trip. That means from the moment I say press forward on my controller to the moment the video come back to me and I can see the thing like going straight, like that is to us the round trip, right? Um, 
we, we realized at this speed, which is around five kilometers per hour, is actually relatively safe to drive. Yeah. So and again, five kilometers per hour is like a fast walk. So I think for, for delivery trips that are relatively short, let's say two to three kilometers, uh, which frankly is actually makes up about 50 to 60% of all delivery. Um, I've seen some charts where the delivery for grab food and a lot of this like DoorDash and all that, uh, if you, it's, 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 as you can imagine, it's, it's very one-sided, right? So most of the trips, well, I would say at least 50% is actually less than, uh, less than five kilometers. Uh, I think 60% less than, and then the other forty. So, so, I mean, obviously this cannot do uh, far distance, um, but I think for those 50, 60%, which is, you know, a pretty substantial chunk of the delivery, I think robots like this, uh, we're not talking about decade away. I think we're talking about years away, maybe a couple of years. Um, yeah. And you don't need AI. Like I said, you just, however, you do need decent 4G and it can work. You don't need 5G, you just need 4G. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Connectivity, I think you talk quite a lot, but I try to mm. piece everything together. So, yeah. um, in terms of video feedback, is files 4G? Everything is 4G. Yeah. Everything is 4G. Maybe the control, video, mm. talking, everything. Because yep. okay. yeah. that's the only connection that we have on this guy. But that's what you mentioned about, like, LoRa. And... Oh, LoRa. Oh, no, that one was Helium. So, he Helium was built on a LoRa WAN. So, we, we don't use LoRa right now. Okay, so yeah. Because you mentioned that. Mm, yeah. 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 Great question. So, so I think it's, um, if you think of it almost like a repeated game, right? Um, I think what we want to do is, let's say, if someone else have driven at this spot, right? Then you basically, oh, this is a 4G date spot. Then, you know, it's, it's almost like ways, you know? Like you share, hey, you know, there's a Mata here, you know, you, so the other fellow driver don't come in. And, you know, so I think, there has to be a lot of this kind of like community sharing. Uh, sorry, sorry. I, I think maybe I've talked too long already. <laughs> okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I'm, uh, I think maybe I should stop first, but happy to answer yeah, more after this. I think, this. Michael, yeah. you'll still be hanging around, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Feel free to take a look so at the I photo. I think uh, it's just a time. You still have one more speaker. Yeah. yeah thank you so much, okay. Okay, Michael. Yeah. Hey. Cool. Yeah. Okay. You so that's fine. Yeah. Okay. All right. Over okay. To you. I okay. didn't expect this to be recorded. So um, also, I didn't expect Chinmay to give the uh, like um, low end talk, basically. Um, so this is this is even lower end than Chinmay. Um, I'm also not a hardware guy. I'm a software guy. Um, but basically, uh, every few years, I kind of have a phase where I think like microcontrollers are cool and I just uh, I just go online and I, I buy a lot of things, random stuff on like Cytron or something. Um, and uh, so these, these are things I bought about like in December last year. Um, this maybe or this LEDs, uh, this thing as well, which is relevant later. Um, it's also great for video calls, actually, if you have it on the table. Um, side effect but yeah this is for like soldering and like seeing stuff that's why there's a magnifying glass so anyway one day i was having all my stuff on my work desk uh, or one night actually and i look up to the ceiling and i see these nice colors because uh, i had one of these led rings next to this magnifying glass and i realized well this is this is basically a projector right it's something that emits lights and a lens that focuses it 
So uh, I thought maybe my daughter will like that, right? She was um, about half a year old at that time. And um, I thought maybe she likes colorful lights. Seems like a safe bet. So I built a little prototype in a cardboard box. Um, and you can see here, I'm also doing like, a, I have like a star shaped, I don't know what you want to call that, stencil or something there. there. Um, a raspberry uh, pipe pico. And uh, yeah, just um, the magnifying glass on top. Um, the results were okay. So I, uh, I ordered the cheapest magnifying glass you can get on Amazon or the cheapest that you can get in like two days because I'm very impatient. So this all happened like within a couple of days because I, I lose focus almost immediately once, once something like that comes along. Um, I did some um, uh, 3D design for my 3D printer, which I'm, I barely know how to do. Um, I think I had some, <laughs> not, all, not all successes. Uh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> um, so, but it's, it, it kind of, uh, after a while, after a couple of attempts, it came out sort of okay. Um, I think that's the result. It's technically a video. I'm not sure if it's, oh, yeah, I can actually play. So that's basically it. I, uh, I brought it with me. Um, I'll plug it in later, but it's probably too bright here and the ceiling is too dark. Uh, also, maybe don't uh, pick it up because it's kind of like half of those little things here, they broke off. So it's, it's, it doesn't really, it's very rickety. It's also, it has like this nice, this nice round shape, which is accidental. It's just, um, what is it called in 3D printing? Um, warping or something. Uh, so it's it's very it's really like minimum effort. It falls apart if you touch it, but it still works. So I'll plug it in later, and you can have a look at it. Um, yeah, um, maybe what's next? Um, probably nothing because, as I said, I usually lose interest in these things very quickly. Uh, but there are so this is an eight by eight LED matrix. You can get um, um, I think thirty two by thirty two that are just a little bit bigger. Um, the magnifying glass I bought also has two lenses, so I, I was experimenting a little bit with like focusing and things like that. That was interesting. So, like a, a future iteration could maybe um, be adjustable in terms of like how big the projection area is, etc. Uh, yeah, and higher resolution. I tried to do like pixel um, art with this, or so just little like um, eight by eight pixel graphics, and you can sort of recognize them, but it doesn't really look nice. So I just reverted to this. Uh, random, uh, yeah, just random fade in, fade out, random colors, basically. Yeah. Any questions? Roland? How much power do you use for that? Sorry? How much power do you use for that? Uh, not a lot. Um, it's, it's actually in, so I, I, I hooked it up directly to the, um, the Pi Pico power, which you're not supposed to do, but, um, it works. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it didn't melt. It worked reliably. I've been using so it's it's really it's part of our like evening ritual when we put our daughter to sleep for a while. This light is on. Um, she doesn't really care, unfortunately. Like she never really appreciated it or anything. Maybe it's just just a bit too young. Um, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe maybe I just uh, need to put in more effort. So if if anybody has ideas for like. Awesome, awesome things to like 3D print and build for, for kids. That would be great. Maybe, maybe some speakers. Yeah, so I was actually, that, that was one thing I wanted to do. We had a, is it called a mobile, like a thing you hang over the crib that like moves around and things. So my original idea was to replace the motor in there because we had like a wind up one and it sounded really crappy. And it had like, you know, this like all analog stuff. So I wanted to build um, an electronic version with a, um, a servo. Um, no, not a server, a stepper motor and um, uh, just playing like old chip tunes. I was looking at like the, uh, what's it called, the soundtrack from Rocky and like Eye of a Tiger or something just to, to get like a, a nice strong kit. But, uh, <laughs> but then before, before I finish it, by the time I got the amp to work, like the amp circuit, before I got that to work, she was already too old for these and started like, uh, like pulling it down and everything. So, so okay. Time yeah, exactly. <laughs> cool. Yeah, I shall plug it in, and uh, you can go about mixing and and everything. I'm not sure if Jinmei, do you do you do like an end uh, moderation? Yeah. What? Can I make one? Oh, yeah.
Um, wait, am I supposed to speak into the microphone? Yeah, I already understood. Yeah, it's still very uh, um, I guess you can contact me for the for the files. Uh, cost is very cheap. It's like less than probably less than fifty sing dollars in total, including magnifying glass and the microchip um, and all that stuff. A um, little bit of three D printing. I'm I'm happy to share the files, but they're not very great. As I said, it kind of falls apart. All right. Shouldn't we? Oh yeah. This one. At today, so the rest of the evening, uh, we can either look at some of the, uh, the hardware or just hang around chit chat. Uh, but before that, uh, last call for announcements. Anybody has any announcements? I know Valentine wanted to talk about hackerspace, so let me bring that up. Nope. What did I open? Something that I shouldn't be opening. <laughs> Uh, was it Open Collective, right? I can't find my mouse though. Uh oh. Oh, there it is. Yay. Yeah, uh, hi. My name is Valentine. I am one of the people behind. Oh, do we okay. actually need to record this? Um, oh, I'm one of the people behind Hackerspace and, you know, this is a, uh, we've been around since 2009. This is our third venue and we're still working on it. We've always been working on it. And um, so this is more like a call for supporters because Hackerspace is a community funded space and we used to be like mostly membership based, but I think it's not really sustainable. We, we spend like about 3,005 a month on rent and we don't actually have that much income. So, you know, if you have some money to chip in, we would like, we would actually like to get the community to, to sub, to support and run the space instead of just depending on members. And, you know, this is our open collective page, which is like a fundraising page. And if you can, you know, if you're interested and you think that we're doing good work, I mean, hopefully. Or if you just want to have a say, then, you know, you can just chip in for like, you can either sign up for membership or just sign up for like a $16 supporter tier. And hopefully like many people, like many hands make light work. Huh? And we can get like maybe 300 people to support the space. And so we don't have to worry about money all the time. So yeah, that's it. Uh, if you have any questions or you want me to like show you around the space, just let me know after this. All right, thanks. Thanks. Thank you once again for Hackerspace for hosting us. Uh, yeah, the, anyway, the, the, the website page is uh, opencollective.com slash hackerspace. Yeah. All right. Any other announcements? Anyone looking for jobs? Anyone want to talk about their events? Okay, cool. Well, then, uh, if, you are, if you have a talk or a project, so if you're doing a project or a hack or something that you want to share the next hackware, let us know either on the meetup or the Facebook or in person. And if you can host hackware for the next, um, the next iteration, so that's probably going to be next month, around the same time a month later, uh, let us know if you can host us a uh, space about as big as this. Uh, otherwise, we can always uh, come back to hackware. Can I yeah, please do. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, if anyone of you are interested to try driving the port, uh, we should be opening up to the public soon. So, you, what, what happens is you can just go to the website, sign up for the slot, and then uh, all you need is just decent broadband and a controller. Uh, any kind of most remote control, I mean, with remote, most game controller will do. You just need to plug into your laptop uh, and it should work. And we will actually have someone physically for the port. So, you can get help, uh, and you can. You can Give it, give it a go. Yeah. Uh, and if you want, if you're interested, uh, I think you can. We are on the usual social media, TikTok, Instagram, and whatnot. So if you follow that, uh, I think maybe in one month, months time we will finally get that ready, and then we'll get that So good at that. Photo box, yeah. It's called photo B O T S. Yeah, photo yeah. Who yeah. yeah. makes the power, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Right. If that's no other announcements, then thank you for 
coming to Hackware. Uh, feel free to hang out and check out some of the stuff yeah, that people have brought. Like and uh, yeah, yeah. Benetton will show us around Hackware, uh, Hackerspace as well. And see you next time. Thanks for coming. Yeah.